If you like my channel and you'd like to support my work on this platform, please consider a small donation on my Patreon page. Link in the description below. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, so welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking again about Age of Samurai. In fact, this is the second video I make about this series and we've got a lot to talk about. There are quite a few things that Gosh, my gosh, this is getting worse at each episode. So since we started the first episode with me performing seppuku, I think I need to do it again, if you excuse me. So, uh, Tom, where is my tanto, the knife? It's not here. Okay, just pass me the wakizashi, will you? Well, then give me the katana, you know, I'll just, uh, I'll just harakiri with the katana, just need a little bit of an overstretch and... Uh... Okay, so what weapon is available then? I need to perform harakiri for crying out loud. The Roman pilum? Well, they give me the Roman pilum, then I'll do harakiri. Did you just say I can't perform harakiri with a Roman pilum? <laughs> Hold my sake. <laughs> Okay, so let's get started with the beginning of the second episode already at minute 109 I've got my first problem because I mean we left off in the first episode that Oda Nobunaga is having all of these great battles and he's showing off how great he is and we have seen some of the battles we have seen the usage of the Tanegashi Matepo, the matchlock type arquebuses and all of these things and you know already the complaints I have about the first episode link in the description below uh, but then at one point we begin the second episode and the commentator tells us that uh, Oda Nobunaga took Kyoto so, you know, I'm there, I'm waiting, I'm like, okay, let's see, uh, let's see the battle, let's see the siege, let's see everything. They show us nothing. I mean, the taking of Kyoto by Oda Nobunaga is probably one of the most significant moments. And I was so looking forward to see how they would show that, but they show absolutely nothing. They just mention it on passing. But hey, so we've got, again, the, uh, they show the map. I've already said all the things that are wrong with that map on the first video that I made. Then they start talking about the populist Buddhist sect, which is great. They explain things well, but when they mention that and they want to show these Buddhists whom sometimes speak modern Japanese and other times they use conjugations that are belong to old Japanese, like the kinu instead of dekinai. I don't know, that was kind of weird. I mean, either go for full modern Japanese or go for... Well, anyways, people probably can't tell anyways. But the monk, the leader, the, the Buddhist monk, the first thing he does is this. Takes his lovely sharp katana and thrusts it on the ground, in the soil. Oh my god. This is a common trope that we see in video game industry, movies, where the hero for some reason takes a perfectly serviceable sharp weapon, usually a blade, and thrusts it point down into the ground, obviously dulling the point and ruining the edge. Now, I'm not saying that no one has ever done something as silly in world history. Of course, you will have now and then the complete idiot moron who will do something like that. But I don't know, just introducing a Buddhist monk who's supposed to be a great warrior and having him do something so dumb for absolutely no reason, particularly in a culture which, of course, we're not in the Edo period, so they still don't revere the katana as much as they will in further centuries. But it's still a weapon that needs respect. That looks very stupid from my point of view. And it's not the only stupid thing that they show that obviously comes right off video games and movies and I don't think you should see in a docu-series because please keep in mind this is a freaking docu-series this is not like a, a fantasy take on um, you know loosely based on historical events this is supposed to be a documentary that is slightly romanticized in the way it portrays the facts but it's got a lot of talking heads I've got a few things to say about the talking heads by the way meaning the actual historians and then you have the character do something so stupid that a real professional warrior wouldn't have done but anyways another thing that they do and I think it's Toyotomi Hideyoshi who does it so he kills everyone with the katana because of course this series is obsessed with the katana more, I'll tell you more about that in a minute um, but what does he do he kills people so the katana is filled with blood and then he does this watch carefully I'll do it again please notice my anime look while I do that I mean this move I'll give you that it's really cool when you're cleaning the katana the blood from off of your katana he even does it with the kote by the way which is armored up so it wouldn't have done anything anyways it's not like he's doing it like, like you know I'm doing it here with my wagi which you know it's made of cloth so it would work 
it would be extremely disgusting because I mean who wants them but whatever um, but he's doing it with an armored cote I'm not joking so first the move itself I'm saying no this is just out of a video game secondly it wouldn't work on the cote so how should they show it as I said in the first episode take a piece of cloth and wipe it but oh no they had to go with the anime move to be honest this TV series looks like it's been created by an anime maniac the way they sit sometimes can be a little weird because sometimes it's good they do something that in Japanese is called agura o kaku agura o kaku and it means basically sitting with your legs crossed which is probably the way most samurai would have been sitting in the Sengoku period. In our day and age in Japan it is very common to sit in seiza which translated means the correct posture, the correct way to sit. But seiza was pushed again in the Edo period and in the Sengoku Jidai uh, you wouldn't really see, I mean yeah you would see the occasionally the occasional samurai sitting in seiza because it's just like you would see anyone occasionally sitting in seiza but you shouldn't imagine like all samurai sitting in seiza because it wasn't really pushed by the government as the correct way and I'd like to underline it's a horrible way to sit because it destroys your knees but yeah go tell them that and so it's good that sometimes they sit in the correct way but other times they do sit in seiza which sometimes it looks a little strange from an actual Sengoku period but it's just a little nitpick of course now let's start talking about the battle scenes or should we call them that even because apart from the CGI which looks all right i mean yeah you can see loads of soldiers in the cgi scenes although they are a little like they look like they're being played on a on a low-end pc trying to max out the graphics and so you get like 17 frames per second i don't know what happened there but anyways you know you see a lot of soldiers and it that does give you the idea that there are a lot of people involved in these battles which there were, by the way. But then when you actually see the, the, the fighting, you always see like a, a little scrap between 12 guys from the pub and 17 hooligans who have just watched Man United play against Arsenal. And another thing that I have to say here as well is that we still have the problem with the katana. The katana is omnipresent. It's ubiquitous. Ubiquitous. Gosh, that word. It's everywhere. Everyone is using a katana. In episode two compared to episode one, we finally start seeing the very, very occasional yari very very occasional uh, this is halved by the way so that it could get into the frame i haven't mounted it on the second part of the shaft once or twice you see the yari two or three naginata you basically mount the blade of a katana on a pole weapon that's pretty much what a naginata is you've got a few of those although interestingly enough they are used for stabbing which i'm thinking it's not that you can't do it but if you want to stab, just use a yari. If you are representing soldiers using a naginata, it would be great if you show me that they use it for cutting, which is what a naginata is supposed to do. But anyways, and then everyone has got katana, katana, katana everywhere. And yet we see not only, and this is why it's getting worse, in the first episode, we see everyone fighting with a katana hand to hand. But in this episode, we see cavalry only using katana. And that is like, oh my gosh, yeah, I see one guy with a Yumi, Three guys with Tanegashi Matepo, the, 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 the arquebuses, the, the guns, if you will. And then all the rest, I see cavalry using katana only. Insane. Mounted samurai should be using naginata, they should be using yari, they should be using bows, they should be using everything but. But a good thing is that finally we start seeing the actual banners on the back of the armor of soldiers, which wasn't the case in the first episode and I complained about it. So I'm glad that in the second episode this starts happening. But as we move on the third episode, that's when we start talking about the ninja, the ninja and the people of Iga Prefecture. And this is the part where I'm going to talk about the historians because already in the first episode I said that there was this historian who was saying that the katana is the most powerful weapon in the pl on the planet and I was already being like you know yeah these guys might be professionals but there's something wrong here but it is on the third episode that it really shit hits the fan. Here are some of the things that these historians are saying. One explains to us the word ninja and he says ninja is a modern reading of a Japanese expression that means secrecy and is pronounced shinobi. Incorrect. So yes, ninja is more modern. I wouldn't really call it modern per se, but it's more modern than shinobi. Absolutely. So in the Sengoku period, they wouldn't have called them ninja. Sure, the, the word shinobi would have been used, but ninja is made of two characters. The first one pronounced nin in onyomi and the second one pronounced ja in onyomi. Nin means stealth. Ja, in this case, is one of the possible ways to say person, kind of an older way. So stealth, person. 
like a spy. Shinobi is the reading only of the first kanji. Shinobi is the kunyomi, so the original Japanese reading of the part nin in ninja. Ja is read mono, so shinobi no mono is the alternative reading of ninja. Shinobi alone is the alternative reading of nin. And I, I think it's important to underline that because I really don't think that the guy who said this speaks or understands Japanese. They say that shinobi no mono or ninja were trained to be assassins and that's something that I've spoken a lot on this channel about. Not all ninjas were assassins, not all ninjas were trained to be assassins. Uh, some ninjas could perform assassinations but generally speaking a ninja is a spy, is intelligence. So you can have ninjas who are great at languages and don't even know how to fight. You can have ninjas who are excellent at fighting also because some ninjas belonged to the bushi class. Gathering intelligence intelligence or are very very skillful scouts and know the area. I mean the variety of abilities that a shinobi no mono, a historical shinobi no mono would have means that it's 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 actually wrong to def to say that a shinobi no mono is a trained assassin or is trained to be an assassin since an early age. Also he says oh my gosh one of them says this talking about the people of the prefecture of Iga they say they could for a few coins do more than an entire army could. Yeah, in your dreams. This is this is a Weibo anime otaku made documentary. The people of Iga were a great problem for Oda Nobunaga to solve. Why? Because they were tough as nails. And guerrilla tactics have been a problem in history. We know that. Even the Romans had problems with the Celts, as I've said in a recent video. But saying that just for a few coins, meaning without the need of any financial backbone, they could do what an entire army could, no. Because if they could do that, they would have conquered the entirety of Japan. And they didn't. They were tough to take out in their own territory, but eventually Oda Nomunaga does. Spoiler alert, I suppose. They couldn't do what an army does, because what an army does is conquer territory, subdue the people, unfortunately sometimes kill the people, and take control. These people couldn't do this. What they could do, the people of the prefecture of Iga, is that they could defend their homeland very effectively and be a problem for moving and marching armies because they knew their territories and they had very sophisticated ways to try to make the best of a horrible situation. Because if you're facing someone as powerful as Oda Nobunaga, he is outnumbering you, he has more money, he has more men, he has better armor, he has better weapon, he's got better everything. But these people, as I say, they were tough, they were well organized and they knew how to make it difficult. But they couldn't do what an army could do and definitely not for a few coins. Also, I'd like to talk a little bit about no Oda Nobunaga because, I mean, in this series, Oda Nobunaga is a complete psychopath. Now, given the man was brutal, I'll give you that. Now, I don't know how many people weren't brutal at this time, but I'm just saying he was particularly brutal, or perhaps he was particularly good at brutality. Furious, someone who is merciless against his opponents, absolutely. But to depict him as a complete lunatic is kind of strange. And for those of you who haven't watched it and you're like, but what do you mean a psychopath? I need to make an impression now because I would gladly show you what I mean. And I mean, go check it out if you don't believe me. If you're like, oh, he's just exaggerating. Go check it out. Episode two and episode three, when he wins the battle of Nagashino immediately after, and then when he's executing the Buddhist monk leader. These are the two situations that I'm referring to. Here is what he does. <laughs> <laughs> that was not exaggerated. This is how they represent Oda Nobu. Okay, so we've got two more things that are continuing from the same friend from the first episode. Namely, every weapon, katana, yari, naginata, goes through armor as if it were butter. Look, it doesn't go through. It doesn't go through. Goodness gracious, you're giving Star Wars a run for their money. So that trend continues and then the idea of no one wears a freaking helmet when you're talking about high-ranked people. And that drives me nuts. Both me and the Shogunate spoke about, about this and said that we were outraged by the fact that people of the likes of Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, Tokugawa Ieyasu, I mean, if you've got rank in this movie, you shall never 
wear a helmet. It doesn't matter. You just got to show them your complicated anime style hairstyle and that's that. Um, you will go into battle with no helmet, which is absolutely moronic. Now, on that note, uh, my friend Anthony Cummings made a very interesting video, which was a sort of, not really a response video, but more of a follow-up video to the video that both me and the Shogunet made about the uh, Age of Samurai. And he was um, sort of uh, bringing up this idea of that sometimes, you know, high-ranking people would not wear helmets and he sort of speaks about all the different cases in which this could happen and it could be plausible and I will leave a link in the description below I think it's a fantastic video but all the examples he gave are situations whereby you know you're marching so great yeah absolutely you are in camp and you don't think that you're being attacked you're still wearing your armor you're sitting on a stool and you're drinking some sake you're not wearing a helmet you got your servants taking care of that absolutely perhaps you're in a situation whereby whereby you are on the battlefield but you're surrounded by hundreds of men and you don't feel that you know you feel safe you don't think you need the helmet in that moment and then he mentions a few other situations great but what this tv series is doing they go deliberately into hand-to-hand -hand combat by choice with a katana and no helmet which is absolutely moronic if you are going to engage in combat and you're a, a man of high status and you have this donning this absolutely exquisite suit of armor but you leave your head completely exposed you will die plus they even do it on foot not even like on top of a horse and you might be like well maybe they can't reach the head no they do it on foot while they are surrounded by enemies and they are fighting with their katana and they're doing all of their cuts because of course it's katana all the time it's freaking katana festival and all you need to end all of your ambitions is one good hit on your head and you're dead and then there is this this historian who keeps s switching between the word aquabus and the word musket and yes there is a difference this the tanigashima teppo is an aquabus and i will make a dedicated video on the difference between aquabuses and muskets aquabuses and musketeers uh, soon on the channel because it's a big topic one last complaint i've got is the mempo what i see so far in all three episodes is that and, and you know when, when it happened on the first episode i was like yeah maybe it was a little costume error but now it's happening all the time three episodes in a row it must be wrong they put it on wrong so the mempo on the warriors that are fighting is hanging really low like this like literally it's not aligned with the face which as far as i understand is incorrect that's not how you wear the mempo let me show you how you wear the mempo so you put on the mempo okay so there are a few ways to attach it uh, i'm just going to show one but i'm going to bring it up I'm going to make sure that it's properly aligned and then I tight it, tighten it very much and there you go. The mempo is perfectly aligned. Now in theory some people say that the mempo should be so tight that you shouldn't be able to speak. I'm not going to do that because I'm a content creator and it would be rather boring for you to see me <laughs> you know watch you staring at the camera for another 10 minutes as you can see uh, my speech is a little impeded because it's very tight at the moment and I could have done it like going around here and then going behind my back I'm just doing a very simple way but just to demonstrate this developers and creators of the age of samurai the mempo needs to be aligned the nose inside the nose the mouth where the mouth opening is so you can actually breathe and you only have a little bit of space here on the eyes that is then overlapped by the kabuto this is how you wear the mempo Instead, this is how they wear the mempo. Literally, this is this is how they wear it. So, uh, what's up with that? Anyways, um, this is so far what I've got. Uh, again, I'm having fun watching this TV series, but goodness gracious, the things that I'm that are happening, and I'm really looking forward to watch episode four and five and make another video. So uh, stay tuned, and of course, subscribe to my channel if you don't want to miss any of these episodes or any of the other videos that I produce on the Metatron channel. Also, let me know what you thought of the TV series in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching. Sarabah.